Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you considered supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Seva, and today, following your requests, we're going to investigate how to build a dynamic, that is, rolling window, Hurst exponent using a simple Python script. Hurst exponent is a very simple to understand and useful and informative metric that can tell you, using one single number, whether the long-term behavior, the long memory in your time series is consistent with the random walk hypothesis, that is, when the value of the Hurst exponent is very close to 0.5, whether your time series is persistent, that is, there is long-term positive autocorrelation with higher returns right now leading to higher returns in the future, and vice versa, when the value of the Hurst exponent is significantly higher than 0.5, or whether the nature of the long memory in your time series is mean reverting or anti-persistent. When the value of the Hurst exponent is less than 0.5, it means that the periods of higher returns are followed by periods of lower or even negative returns, and vice versa. It can be very useful to additionally inform your quantitative trading strategies or momentum trading in general. So let's investigate the script that can be used to estimate your Hurst exponent in rolling windows for time series in question, because in Excel, it is quite tricky to implement dynamic Hurst exponents as you have to continuously separate, chop up, your sample into smaller and smaller subsamples and estimate rescaled ranges and the relationship between rescaled range at a particular subsample at a particular granularity with the length of said subsample. However, Python in its flexibility allows one to do that very efficiently. The packages that we'll need today are your usual candidates NumPy and Pandas to work with arrays and data frames respectively. To visualize our Hurst exponent in dynamics, we will import matplotlib pyplot as plt. To import financial data from Yahoo Finance, we will use Y Finance package. And to estimate our regressions and do some simple hypothesis testing with tstats, we'll use stats models API and scipy stats packages. Now let's move on to the heart of our code, to the heart of our script. First of all, we need to specify how long of a rolling sample we need. And uh, for uh, convenience and to get uh, the highest power estimate of your Hurst exponent, you generally pick the length of a subsample equal to a power of 2. So 1024, 1024 is a very common choice because it's 2 to the power of 10. So we can select the power of 2 to be equal to 10 and then the uh, rolling sample length that we choose is to the power of 10. And again, here is where finance is a blend of an art and a science. And uh, you can estimate your host exponent more precisely if you select a higher subsample length, but then it will um, initiate a trade-off between recency and precision, because to estimate the host exponent on, for example, 2048, um, observations, you'll need to move as far back as eight years, because 2,000 trading days is roughly eight years, isn't it? So you would have more outdated data uh, crawling into your estimation. So this trade-off is something for a particular trader or a quantitative analyst to decide for themselves. However, the flexibility of this code allows you to pick whatever you want and run the code and see how the results compare. Then let's specify the data set that we'll investigate, and let's keep it simple. Let's pick S&P 500, uh, GSPC being the Yahoo Finance ticker for S&P 500 benchmark. Let's start at year-end 2015 and, uh, and 16th of June 2021, the most recent trading day currently available. Then we'll download the data using the Yahoo Finance download command, uh, specify the ticker and the start and end dates, and only select the closing price because that's everything we need for our Hurst exponent estimations. Then we'll convert our uh, raw data into an array of prices, so calculations are easier, 
and then we'll calculate returns using the simple formula. Price today divided by price yesterday minus one in the array format over here. Then we'll initialize three empty arrays that we care about in our Hurst exponent calculations in a rolling window. That is, we'll track how the Hurst exponent itself changes through time and how the respective t stats and p values behave, so we can do some hypothesis testing as well in terms of whether our Hurst exponent is significantly different from 0 0.5, either in the positive or negative direction. To be more robust in our signal identification in terms of either persistent or mean reverting behavior of S&P 500. And now we can finally move in a loop to calculate the rolling window Hurst exponent, starting with date n, day n, that is the first day where we have got n observations available for our estimation, and ending at the very last day, simply because uh, NumPy arrange and range functions do not include the last value, we can say the length of our return array plus one, because it will cut off at the previous value. That would allow us to calculate the Hurst exponent for the 16th of June, which is the end date of our sample. Then we need to specify the subsample we are currently uh, dealing with, we are currently estimating the Hurst exponent for, and that would be uh, a subsample of our returns array, uh, starting at day t minus n and ending at t, t being this loop uh, variable that moves from n until the very end. And then we can already specify our x uh, variable, which is the uh, number of all observations in our subsample, basically the power of two corresponding to the uh, number of observations in a particular subsample. And here we start at two and cut it off at the maximum power we have got here. Again, we say power plus one over here simply because the arrange, numpy arrange function cuts off at the previous value. And we start at two rather than at zero, for example, because we do not want our estimates to be too noisy. Estimating rescaled range on uh, subsamples of one observation are just uh, impossible because you have to calculate standard deviation and you cannot calculate it based on uh, one observation. And for two observations, this would be very noisy. So we only start in uh, considering subsamples uh, at least of four elements because two to the power of two is four. You can uh, be uh, more uh, meticulous and say, for example, uh, you only will consider observations with uh, eight observations at least, so this could change to three, to four, you can alter it uh, to again uh, achieve uh, different results and see how they change depending on your assumption set. However, let's stick with two here because we can still estimate the risk yield range quite well using four observations. And then we initialize an empty NumPy array for our y variable, which would be the logarithm of average risk yield range across all of our subsamples. And then we start moving uh, in our x array and specifying uh, the sum samples of uh, 2 to the power x elements. So m is the number of observations in a particular subsample. Quite naturally, it's 2 to the power of p. So we move from, again, uh, subsamples containing as few as four elements to subsamples containing as much as the whole sample, as much as 1024 observations. And then S is the number of such subsamples, and quite naturally, we just divide uh, 1024 in our case by M and get 2 to the power of power minus P. So if you have four uh, subsample length, then you will have 256 uh, individual subsamples. If your subsample length is 512, you'll just have two such subsamples. And then we initialize an empty array of rescaled ranges across these subsamples. Then we start moving across those, so we just uh, move from 0 to s, that means that we'll uh, take into account all s of our subsamples, and then we calculate uh, the mean, the deviate, uh, the uh, range, so the difference between maximum and minimum, the standard deviation, and the rescaled range for each and every subsample. Here we just uh, accurately uh, chop up our current rolling uh, sample, to include only the observations we care about for a particular subsample of a particular index i. Then we calculate the average across this particular subsample. Then our cumulative deviate is the cumulative sum 
and here the numpy cumulative sum function is quite um, handy because we can just calculate numpy cumulative sum of subsample minus mean to calculate cumulative deviates and then our range uh, which is uh, the basis of rescaled range calculations would be the maximum of our cumulative deviates minus the minimum of our cumulative deviates for a particular subsample again. Then we calculate subsample specific standard deviations and our rescaled ranges are just the ratios between those ranges, those differences between maximum and minima and the standard deviations we have just calculated. And then we append our rescaled range array uh, with the calculation we have just undertaken. And then we can finally uh, calculate the y variable, the particular observation that's relevant to this particular subsample breakdown for a particular rolling window sample. And uh, that would be the base two logarithm of the average across all subsamples for the rescaled range value. And here, uh, the base two logarithm is very crucial because our power in question is two and uh, our x variable is the power that we raise two to to get our uh, subsample uh, length. And uh, if we had, for example, base three, uh, then we would have base three logarithm over here uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, here, base two is uh, very important for Hurst exponent calculations because it's the smallest uh, positive integer that is use usable for Hurst exponent calculations. And uh, why the smallest? Well, because it gives you the most observations for your Hurst exponent estimation. And as this estimation is a regression, then you need as many observations you can get. And uh, that's why two, because more observations lead to a more precise uh, estimation of the Hurst exponent and more statistical power to this test of determining whether this uh, estimate is significantly different to 0 0.5. And that's exactly what we're concerned with now. We specify our regression model as an OLS regression of y, which is the base to logarithm of the rescaled range across subsamples. And uh, we add a constant to our x uh, variable, which is actually a base to logarithm of uh, our subsample length, simply because this is what we raise two to the power of to get our subsample length m. And then we fit this regression and obtain the slope of this simple uh, linear regression using the uh, params function for our regression result res. And then we can calculate the test statistic uh, by just using a simple t-test, comparing the result, the Hest exponent um, estimate, that is the slope of the regression to 0 0.5, which is the null hypothesis. If the Hurst exponent is equal to 0 0.5 or very close to 0 0.5, then uh, the financial time series you're investigating is random walk. And we divide this difference by the standard error to get our t stat. And then we can calculate the p value, so how uh, statistically significant this uh, deviation from 0 0.5 is by using a two tailed uh, t test, using a cumulative distribution. Uh, of the uh, student's t distribution uh, from SciPy stats package. And we plug in the absolute value of the t stat and the residual degrees of freedom from our regression above. And then we can append our three arrays of interest with the respective uh, value of the Hess exponent, the t stat and the p value of the test we have just executed, and finally visualize our results. And uh, let's visualize two figures. They would um, augment each other in terms of uh, letting us know what's going on with uh, long memory in S&P 500 uh, returns. So first, we will just visualize the dynamics of the Hurst exponent itself, and uh, to make uh, changes in it more visible across time, we'll set uh, the limits uh, on the y-axis to be 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, so we'll see uh, how the exponent evolves uh, in comparison to the, the base value of 0 0.5. And uh, these two commands actually do that. They visualize the Hurst exponent values calculated across rolling windows uh, with the, the dates plotted on the x-axis and also 0 0.5 uh, plotted uh, alongside the same dates. That allows us to compare the value to 0 0.5 and visualize the results more fruitfully. 
Uh, here we also uh, reduce the label size for our dates because dates are quite bulky and they would hover over each other if the label size is the default version. So we'll just set it to eight over here. And uh, the second uh, plot that we'll do is visualize the t-stat alongside the critical values. And here we just again plot our t-stats alongside the dates and uh, the uh, positive and negative uh, critical t-stat for uh, two-tailed um, confidence intervals that are half a percent and 99.5 percent because our test is two-tailed so a one percent confidence interval would be uh, half a percent from the left hand side and uh, half a percent from the right hand side and again as the residual degrees of freedom are the same across all regressions we can just plug those as degrees of freedom for our percentile point function which is just the inverse uh, cumulative distribution function or the quantile function if you wish and now we can finally run this code and see the results that it spits in and it won't take long uh, approximately half a minute for such an estimation and the code has just stopped the calculations and we can see the dynamics of the Hurst exponent in blue uh, compared to the uh, null hypothesis value of 0 0.5 as a straight line here in orange uh, alongside various dates and we can see that we start around uh, February 2020 uh, simply because we can only start with the uh, 1024th observation uh, meaning that there is enough data for us to estimate the first rolling window and we can see that the Hest exponent is relatively stable but there is a quite noticeable positive trend uh, in terms of the Hest exponent and uh, it is always above 0 0.5 meaning that the S&P 500 uh, returns are quite robustly uh, persistent meaning that periods of higher returns lead to periods of higher returns continuing into the future and to reinforce that claim we can study the dynamics of the t-stat and we can see that it is always at least close to the positive uh, critical value of around 2.8 for the given uh, degrees of freedom value and uh, it is almost always exceeding the positive critical value of 2.8 and currently as of June uh, 2021 the t-stat is above 10 which means that it's very reliably persistent in terms of S&P 500 returns and uh, various trading strategies uh, that uh, are concerned with momentum or exploiting long-term uh, trends in stock returns can be indeed profitable on the US stock market and that's all there is regarding the estimation of dynamic rolling window Hurst exponent using a Python script. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions in terms of business, economics, or finance videos you would like me to record. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.